Hello, and welcome to Galen Data's Medical Device Connectivity Innovation Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Galen Data. Our topic today is Pathways for Successful Medical Device Quality Audits. We'll be discussing strategies and best practices for enhancing compliance to quality processes. Our guest today, our guest presenter today is Stephen Ford, a seasoned quality auditor. Stephen is managing partner and founder of OMedTech, an advisory company providing expertise in quality systems, regulatory compliance, operations, engineering, and of course, auditing. Uh, Stephen's experience spans class three implantable devices, as well as a wide range of class one and class two devices. Uh, he has held several executive positions in medical device startups. Stephen, welcome. Howdy. So to briefly go over some logistics today, you can submit your Q&A session questions at any time in the questions window. Uh, handouts overviewing Galen Data and OMED Tech are available for download in your consoles right now. Uh, we're gonna be conducting two polls during the webinar to learn more about you, our audience, and then a recording of this webinar will be provided in a follow-up email. Uh, Stephen, before we jump into the topic at hand, can you tell us a little bit about OMED Tech and what your expertise is? Sure. Uh, we're a medical device advisory. We're focused on supporting companies uh, with our expertise in regulatory affairs, uh, quality management systems, and quality audits. Uh, our goal is to help you be successful working within these unique regulatory uh, environments. Uh, we bring over 100 plus years of collective experience working with the high, in this highly regulated uh, medical device industry. Uh, our capabilities include regulatory advice and submission preparation, uh, quality management system development, implementation, certification, and, and also day-to-day -day, uh, management of uh, QMS. Uh, we do quality system audits, we do supplier audits, and we help manage FDA inspections and ISO certifications. Steve, is, that, is it accurate to say that once somebody thinks they have it all figured out, they probably do, but it'll change the next day? Yeah, uh, maybe the next uh, half day. It's it's uh, uh, an ever-changing landscape. And and you're going to help us today help our audience navigate through that uh, landscape. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, just to remind everybody on our webinar about Galen Data and our Galen Cloud product. Uh, the Galen Cloud is a secure, compliant, and turnkey cloud connectivity platform. It is purpose-built specifically for medical devices. It's a platform compatible with, compatible with all cloud infrastructures, AWS, Azure, et cetera. Um, it is ISO 13485 certified and compliant with a wide range of re regulatory requirements such as FDA, HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA. Uh, and it's a very useful and robust product. It's got a highly configurable interface for data access, data display, different levels of access can be defined, alerts and alarms, and much, much more. So today we're gonna to go over a number of topics in our um, webinar on successful pathways for quality audits. We're gonna first talk about why audits are important and how they can actually add value to your organization. Uh, Steve will then transition into best practices for audit preparation, uh, some uh, strategies for conducting the audit itself, and then that all important feedback loop what to do after the audit, post-audit activities, and preparing for the next audit. Before we get into our webinar, though, we're going to conduct a poll. And our poll is to ask you, what type of organization do you represent? I'll ask our producer to go ahead and launch that poll. Uh, but please answer if you are representing a medical device manufacturer, Perhaps your company has software as a medical device. Uh, you could come from a, represent a, a design and development company, or perhaps the focus of your organization is quality or regulatory. And then of course, if you don't fit into any of those categories, please select other. Optional poll, but we do like to keep our fingers up on the pulse of who's attending our webinars. So medical device manufacturer, software as a medical device, design and development company, your focus is quality or regulatory or other. 
see we have a lot of answers coming in. I'll give everybody just a few more seconds to answer the poll. And we can go ahead and close it out. All right, so thank you for your responses. Steve, uh, you know, we've, we, we've, uh, we've done a dry run for our presentation. You tell a really good story. Uh, and I'll ask you, to, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now to tell the story, the importance of quality audits, and what members of our audience should focus on in preparing, conducting, and following up on that, on quality audits. So Steve, over to you. Okay, thanks, Keith. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as the title of the uh, of this uh, discussion uh, states, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about audits, but I'm going to focus uh, really on how to create and maintain a healthy quality management system. Uh, to give you some perspective, uh, I conduct between uh, 40 and 50 internal audits uh, and supplier audits per year. I manage eight to 12 audits per year for clients, uh, customer audits, as well as FDA and ISO certification audits. I spend a lot of time preparing for audits, uh, being audited and responding to the output of audits. Uh, the internal audits that I do are scrutinized and critiqued frequently uh, as a result of the ISO audits that uh, I go through. Uh, this has taught me to appreciate what a good audit is uh, why audits are important and how impactful they are at, at, uh, as far as the well-being of your quality management system. So the, uh, in today's world, you need to be ready for audits every day. Uh, as a result of 21 CFR 820, ISO 1345-2016, uh, the EU medical device directives, and other national regulatory bodies, um, audits are one of the key tools that they have to ascertain whether, the, whether or not your quality management system is compliant and that you're producing product uh, that is safe and effective. So some of the audits that you may go through, uh, I've listed those below. So uh, per the uh, standard and the regulation, you're going to do internal audits. Uh, you're going to conduct supplier audits. Uh, from time to time, you're going to be audited by customers. Uh, you, if you've got ISO certification, you're going through surveillance and certification audits. If you have a sterile product, you'll be going through notified body microbiology audits. Uh, if you have a CE mark, you'll do CE uh, certification audits. Um, from time to time, you're going to be visited if you have a domestic product. Um, FDA will come in and do an inspection to the QSRs. Uh, depending on what state you're in, you may also have state inspections uh, like we do here in Texas. And finally, if you're uh, participating uh, or working with one of the five countries that's involved in the medical device single audit program, uh, those audits are quite detailed and uh, frequently pretty long. So uh, the uh, one of the areas that I, I look at is people's reactions to audits. Uh, for all, all auditees, uh, you, they'll all tell you that they're somewhat stressful and nobody likes a lot of stress. Uh, so already we, they kind of have a negative. Uh, for others, uh, audits are painful. Uh, they expose your system and maybe your own work to scrutiny and they force you to face uh, or confront deficiencies in your system and maybe in yourself. Uh, audits are time consuming. It takes a lot of time to prepare uh, and to get to a point where you feel comfortable uh, that you're ready for uh, an audit. Uh, they create more work. Uh, and for a lot of quality uh, uh, professionals, you're already overwhelmed with the, the variety of regulatory requirements that are in place today and that are coming on uh, stream. And so uh, audits just add more to an already overworked uh, environment. And last but not least, uh, audits can be a source for uh, potential uh, external uh, audit nonconformances. Uh, I've had auditors that even though we got audited for something, we've identified it, uh, when they found it, uh, we got another, it gave them an opportunity to give us another nonconformance. So why audits? Audits are health meters for our quality systems. 
uh, they provide feedback to us about uh, whether or not our quality system is actually working. In a lot of companies, there's a phantom quality system at work. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you don't have audits, uh, you, you wouldn't know that there's another system in play, but audits will reveal to you that uh, people do what uh, is most uh, uh, common is they're, they're trying to improve their system or how they work. And so they make changes on their own to uh, improve the, uh, the time it takes, the quality that they're, they're creating, uh, but they don't necessarily come back and run that through the documented system. So you've got a system that's running behind the scenes that doesn't align with your written system. Uh, that's a surefire opportunity for a nonconformance in an audit. Uh, audits also force uh, company staff uh, to take responsibility for their areas and ownership for their part of the quality management system. Audits also keep executive management engaged in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, you need executive management to understand uh, some of the battles that you're going through in, in trying to maintain compliance. Uh, it also demonstrates to external auditors that you have an effective auditing program, uh, that it's well run, that it meets the requirements of suitable and effective uh, as far as your quality management system. What is a successful audit? Well, that has lots of different definitions. Uh, just some that I, I see uh, as a result of audits. Uh, if you get to the end of the audit and the world didn't stop or come to an end, you feel that was a success. Uh, you may feel like you su successed if you survived with only minor cuts and bruises. The best of all worlds is you got no nonconformances and nothing to fix. Uh, my caution there is, are you really, did you really gain anything from that audit? Uh, and the other is uh, it provides, if you, your boss and your executive management are happy with the result, well, you may still have a job. So what's, a, what's the definition of a success uh, from a more enlightened perspective? Uh, you gain perspective by looking at your quality management system through someone else's eyes. You have paradigms that uh, you have established based on your education, your experience, uh, maybe how many audits that you've been through. So you see your quality system one way. Uh, auditors come in and are able to look at your quality system and give you a different perspective and hopefully one that improves uh, the, uh, the value of your quality management system. It also exposes flaws. Uh, that heighten and that heightens your awareness and allows you to make corrective actions. An area that people don't take advantage of enough is uh, taking information from the auditor. Uh, auditors spend a lot of time training. Uh, they go through lots of audits. They see lots of quality systems. They find they see all the the warts, if you will. They also see the good things. And so they will, uh, on occasion, just in casual conversation, provide you little nuggets of gold that you can take and add to your quality system. Uh, audits also bring your quality system into sharper focus. When do you prepare for the next audit? Well, optimum timing is uh, the day after the last audit. And actually, you should be ready every day. Uh, once upon a time, FDA would not give you the advance notice that they typically do today. Uh, they would just show up. So you needed to be ready all the time for that surprise visit uh, that would stop your heart at the uh, beginning of a day. Uh, that hasn't gone away, though. If you've got a CE mark, uh, per the regulations, you're going to have an unannounced audit sometime over the five-year period of your certificate. Uh, your, your suppliers, key suppliers, may also experience this same unannounced audit. So there's five things that I, I see that uh, will allow you to have a successful uh, audit. 
the first one is your company culture. Uh, does executive management see value in your quality management system? Uh, that's really important. Uh, I don't, I can't tell you how many times I've uh, audited companies and you can tell that executive management is not as engaged as uh, they probably need to be. They don't understand why their, their quality system isn't working effectively. Uh, so they're, they need to be more engaged. Uh, executive management needs to make sure that they have given the responsibility and uh, the support to the management representative who they've assigned the task of making sure that the quality management system is suitable and effective. They also need to communicate with their employees and let their employees know that they expect them to take responsibility and that they expect them to be compliant with the quality management system. You can go on through this one, Keith. The next element that you need to think about is your documentation. Uh, documentation is the main way that we demonstrate to an external auditor that the system that we have is working effectively. Uh, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. So you want to be sure that you've got good documentation. And that starts with a good quality manual. A lot of times we overlook the quality manual, but it's basically a map. Uh, and like a map, uh, if it doesn't have uh, good information on it, um, if it doesn't tell you something as simple as which way is north, uh, if you're not familiar with the area that you're trying to uh, identify a location, uh, without those markers, you can't get from point A to point B. The, the quality system is the same way. Your, your, your quality manual is the map to your quality system. So it needs to be well designed. Uh, it needs to align with the standards and the regulations that your company needs. The, the area of the, the, the quality of the quality system and your documents that stands out to me the most is language. Uh, we write our quality manuals and our procedures in the language that seems to be familiar to us uh, without necessarily thinking about we may be audited and we need to make this so that uh, it communicates effectively to the auditor. And really what it's doing is it's making sure that your procedures, your quality manual are aligned with the regulations and the standard. Uh, I go into companies where they, uh, uh, they've they used different terminology to try to explain, well, something like design control. And by the time I've read through it, I don't know exactly how they're pointing at the things that I have to audit. And so we ha have to spend time trying to translate their language back into the regulatory or standard language. So my recommendation is, Align your language with the language in this, that's in the standards and the regulations. Uh, those words are, are very important. The next element is training. Uh, how many of y'all have training that uh, is read and acknowledge? I really like reading and read and acknowledge. That that's so simple and it, it really does the job. Not uh, read and acknowledge works sometimes. But in most cases, uh, when I've done read and acknowledge and then done a pop test afterwards, seldom do people uh, understand the, the key elements of what they've supposedly been trained on. Uh, recently, I went through an audit uh, and the auditor asked uh, the quality manager, uh, I'm sorry, the purchasing manager, uh, he'd he said he'd like to see the approved supplier list. And uh, he also said he'd like to see how the uh, purchasing manager uh, got the approved supplier list and, and how he chose suppliers to purchase from. So they went back to the purchasing manager's desk and the purchasing manager attempted to fulfill his desires. They came back and uh, the purchasing manager was pretty red faced. He had been with the company for over 30 years and uh, he, he wasn't familiar with the approved supplier list. And when he went out to the uh, company uh, server, he couldn't find the approved supplier list uh, on the server and ultimately uh, confessed that he never used the approved supplier list to pick any of the suppliers. So uh, 
the only saving grace of that whole thing was is that uh, the quality manager had made sure that all of the people that he was purchasing from happened to be on the approved supplier list. So training is really important. And whether you've been at a company uh, a year or 30 years, you need to understand what the quality management system requirements are. Uh, one of the areas that I recommend is that uh, supervisors do many audits uh, to periodically to determine that their, um, their employees understand the requirements that they're being asked to follow. The next element is internal audits. Internal audits are a powerful tool. Uh, they help you uh, better understand what your system is, is all about. And uh, they, they point to, if they're done well, they point to areas for uh, potential uh, corrective action. You wanna make sure that your auditors are trained and experienced in the areas that you want them to audit. Now, this is a plug for OmedTech, but a lot of my customers, uh, they don't have personnel that are trained as auditors. And in, in fact, uh, the people that they would choose are already in, invested in the quality management system and therefore are not eligible to do the audits. So you need people that know the areas and can give you a, a good uh, deep dive audit. Uh, the audit needs to challenge your quality management system. You need to be sure that you're seeing benefit rather than liability for corrective actions that you identify. And you need to be sure that you're identifying root causes. And I'm not talking about the surface level ones, but what's really broken. And you need to, be, need to be sure that corrective actions are a priority. So the next element is the day-to-day -day operation. And this, this is really, uh, I'd say of all of these, one of the critical elements because uh, you're looking to the entire staff. Uh, they need to be following their procedures on a daily basis. And your, your quality management system is chock full of uh, what I'd call quality commitments that you've made. You've got commitments that are required by the standard and regulation, but then you've also got commitments that you have inserted into these procedures. And you wanna be sure that you've met all those commitments that you've made. So things like if you're supposed to monitor temperature and humidity, if you've got a clean room, and you're supposed to do that daily, you need records that demonstrate that you've done that. Uh, let's say you have a cleaning regimen they're supposed to go through uh, and you're gonna document that, you need to be sure that people are doing that. Uh, too often, uh, that's low hanging fruit for an auditor to find uh, non-conformances uh, in meeting quality uh, commitments. And last thing uh, on the day-to-day -day operation, uh, are corrective actions being performed in a timely manner? So we're six weeks prior to the, the audit. There, there's some things that you need to do to prepare. Uh, I recommend that you create a checklist of your quality commitments. That's gonna take a little time because most of us haven't done that uh, too frequently. And you need to take it down and be very detailed. You need to sit down with that checklist with the participants uh, that are going to uh, be in the audit in other words, the areas that are going to get audited, the people that are responsible for those, those areas, and go through those checklists with them and determine where you, you've been successful and maybe where you haven't. You need to establish a plan for those activities that may be behind. Uh, hopefully, everything's on track. You don't need the plan. But let's say that you've got a few things that are uh, maybe not as clean as they need to be. You need to plan and you need to monitor that plan and the progress to that plan regularly. And last but not least, you need to go back and look at any non-conformances you had, uh, either your notified body or an FDA inspection, and you need to be sure that you have closed those uh, non-conformances out um, and that everything's clean on those. So two weeks before the audit, uh, things should be coming together. At that point, you need to be getting uh, fine-tuned. Uh, you need to have uh, copies of the documents that I've got listed here. I won't run through all these in, in detail, but basically all the things that the auditor is going to ask you right off, off the, at the beginning of the audit. Uh, you need to have those ready and available because you want the audit to run smoothly. So perceptions are really important uh, and you can set that perspective 
for the auditor at the very outset. So some things that need to be upfront is you need to have plans uh, for what's going to happen, you know, the routine things for the day. Uh, things like you need to be ready to tell the auditor where the restrooms are, uh, your policy for pictures uh, and for confidentiality. And one of my most important things is preparation for lunch. What are we having and when are we going to have it? Uh, and then most important in today's world are the requirements for the pandemic, uh, distancing, uh, mask, uh, and the requirements uh, that the company has established for that. You want to be sure that the participants that need to be in the opening meeting are available immediately for the opening meeting and there are no delays. Uh, and then uh, you want to make sure that uh, that you've got uh, people ready uh, throughout the day for uh, areas that are going to be audited. Uh, the auditor will will recognize this. Uh, I've had when we've done a good job at that. Typically, the auditor makes a comment about it and it sets the tone for the audit. So managing the audit, as I said, personnel need to be able to uh, be available to answer the questions and uh, need to have your records available as soon as possible to uh, answer auditors' uh, requirements. So some things to remember, don't argue, discuss. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if there's a non-conformance you don't agree with, you know, I would say uh, you can discuss it a little more, but take it and move on. Document the suggestions, comments, and criticisms of the auditor. There's gold in those comments. And then ask questions to verify exactly what the auditor is saying, and it, particularly in a non-conformance situation, that you understand specifically uh, what their concern is. Okay, the auditors left the building. Uh, the, the next moment, you take a, a second uh, and relax just a bit. Give your little, give yourself a little mental pat on the back if you were prepared, and then you turn around and we do it all over again. So in the next, the, the next day, you want to begin your corrective actions. If there, if there were correct uh, nonconformances, you want to start your corrective action plans. You want to establish uh, the system for how you're going to address those and you want to communicate uh, soon, often, regularly with your auditors so you can get those closed. So the easiest audit you should have should be your ISO audit. Uh, that ISO audit is looking to make sure that you're being compliant. Uh, typically it's not a deep, deep dive. It, they dive to a certain level and they stop because they have too many things that they have to cover. Your most exhaustive audit should be your internal audit. That one should go deep and really dig into all the crevices of your quality management system. So key points. Uh, you need to be sure that you've got a company culture that uh, puts the quality system uh, at the top, uh, that executive management is actively involved. You need to have well thought through documentation and you need to make sure that you're uh, quality manual and your procedures address the language that's in the standard. You need to have people that are effectively trained and that are following uh, the quality procedures. And you need to be sure you're looking outside of your paradigms uh, at your quality management system. And then, then you, you need to use uh, audits, both internal and external, to maintain perspective as to the health of your quality management system. So what are the benefits? Uh, key benefits, you have a, a consistent process, you have improved product quality, uh, you've established regulatory compliance. Uh, all those things go together to reduce costs, both for personnel and product. That improves your bottom line and ultimately you have satisfied customers. So I'll stop there and let Keith take over. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. And kind of to put a wrapper around the, the wonderful story you told is, is to share with the audience how you and I both view cloud connectivity factors into audits. Um, so how do cloud connectivity and audits converge? 
Yeah, our viewpoint at Galen Data is that our cloud connectivity, our Galen Cloud, becomes part of the medical device, becomes part of the offering to the clinician, to the patient, and it should be viewed with the same level of regulatory scrutiny, quality management, and in this case, auditing as the medical device itself. Uh, cloud connectivity should be developed under the same quality controls, including auditing. Uh, quality management system audits help assure that cloud connectivity applications such as the Galen Cloud meet your business objectives, meet other established requirements, and then that it, it encourages the maintenance of processes and data to provide added assurance. I, I will, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I'll share that uh, Galen Data, we do um, consult with uh, OmedTech. They are on our team. And they've done a wonderful job of guiding us down the regulatory and quality management pathway. About a month ago, I was lead here internally. One of our customers we were getting ready to bring on said, we need to perform a quality audit of your QMS. They scheduled six hours. I literally, Steve, I, I don't know if I shared this level of detail with you. I literally spent two hours preparing for that audit. They scheduled six hours. And at about the one and a half hour point, he said, we're done. You guys have it all buttoned up. He was very impressed. And the next day they signed the contract. So I thank you for your expertise and your guidance in helping us. But, but I think you know the biggest takeaway is that quality in general and then your focus on auditing has to become part of the culture of the organization from the top down. And that's a, a very important takeaway from your presentation today, I thank you for. All right, we're going to go ahead and launch into our second poll of the day, and that is for all of our audience members, what is your level of audit preparedness right now, right this moment? Uh, at the top of the list, you're ready right now. Uh, bring it on. They could knock on the door. You're ready to, to show them around. Uh, next level is you're in pretty good shape. Just need a, a, a day or two to, to clean up and, and button things up. A uh, next choice preparation would be a significant undertaking, but it could be done. It'd be an all hands on deck effort. Uh, next answer would be preparation would be a major effort and you're not sure where to begin. No shame in that. Uh, your responses are, are anonymous, so please just answer honestly. And then lastly, you may not, because of what you do, because of the type of organization you represent, you may not be subject to quality audits. So you're ready right now, you're in good shape, just need a day or so to, to clean things up. You could be ready, uh, but it's a significant undertaking. It would be a major effort to prepare and you're not really sure where to begin. And then lastly, you're not subject to quality audits. We'll give everybody, I see a lot of good responses coming in. We'll give everybody a few more seconds and then we'll go ahead and close out the poll. Thank you. So your next steps, you know, we, we in our webinar series, our webinar innovation series, we like to leave everybody with um, actionable next steps. So number one, think about where you are right now today with what you've heard from Stephen Ford. Where are you regarding audit preparation and what areas could you be addressing right now? Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, our webinar recording will be made available in the next day or so. I encourage you to go back through it and, and pick three things. Pick three things that you can focus on right now to improve your audit preparation. Secondly, have you considered cloud connectivity in your audit preparation? Um, part of our viewpoint here at Galen Data is we become your quality partner. We become your audit partner. Um, that part of the audit on your system, your medical device ecosystem, we are well prepared to support you. So number three, that leads me to number three, let us know if Galen Data can help you now. Let us know if OmedTech can help you now. You see our contact information there on the screen, that will be up during our Q&A session. But please, you know, we're always open to conversations, to spitballing ideas. We'd love to talk to you to see where we can help you in this regard. So um, I will also announce our webinar next month. It's actually gonna occur at the top of December, December 1st, uh, Tuesday, December 1st, from one to 2 p.m. Central Time. We're gonna focus on venture capitalists. The title of the webinar is Venture Capitalist Perspective on the Medical Device Industry. Creating value now to maximize future investment. Uh, we have representatives from three uh, highly regarded venture capital firms 
CFV Ventures, S3, and Baird Capital, who will all share with our audience their perspectives on what they like to see medical devices focusing on at, during uh, at various stages of the company life cycle and the product life cycle. We uh, hope that, read, that uh, webinar will be of value to you. In the comments uh, section of your console, you will see the registration link. So you can click on that right now and register for that webinar right now as well. So on to the Q&A. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can submit your questions in the question window in the GoToWebinar console, and a recording of the webinar will be available via email. Steve, I'm looking at the console. The questions are rolling in. Um, here's a good one. It's more of a clarification. Uh, it says, earlier in the webinar, you talked about if you have the CE mark, you are assured of having an unannounced audit once every five years. Is there any warning at all, or do they simply show up? They simply show up. They knock on the a... door and say, I'm, I'm, I'm here to audit you. Right. Wow. Uh, you have you have to typically with the notified bodies you have to sign an agreement that you're going to uh, be ready for unannounced audits as part of your CE uh, getting your CE certificate or your EC certificate. Okay. Uh, next question gets to your training slide. Um, what do you recommend as far as training uh, certification or validation in lieu of a simple read and acknowledge? I guess what's the what's the next level up in making sure that our employees are properly trained on our quality procedures? So if you read through the standard, uh, you'll see that it talks a lot about risk. And so you need to uh, assess risk for each of the areas that you're planning to have training for. And uh, depending on the risk level, uh, you may, and also uh, is the person doing, uh, using the information directly, or is it uh, more of a, just a need to know? Uh, in a need to know situation, reading the knowledge works great. But in the areas where it's, it's fundamental to what they're doing, uh, if you feel like the risk is high, then you need to, there's several different things that you can do. One is, uh, you can do an oral test uh, and have them explain to you exactly how they would go about doing it. Uh, you can have a demonstration where they demonstrate that they have followed the how they would follow the procedure. Uh, and in some cases, uh, particularly in production, uh, you know, if you've got a, a, an assembly that you're building, uh, have them build uh, a certain number of assemblies and go through your inspection process and you don't release them to work on product until they have su been successful on uh, however many you think is uh, necessary to demonstrate proficiency. That's helpful, that's very helpful. So the answer is it depends, it depends on what right. the training is focused on to the level. Yeah, okay, that makes sense, I like that. Um, all right, we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. How do you bridge the language used by the standards and auditors with the language used by day-to-day -day teams such as engineering with your SOPs being the bridge or, or between those two different viewpoints? Yeah, that, that one's kind of hard. Um, and I, since I audit, uh, I, I have to lean more toward the, the auditor perspective. Um, I, I deal with engineers all the time. I am an engineer, but I can tell you that a lot of time uh, went into uh, the selection of the words that are in the standard and the regulation. They're chosen uh, not only uh, for exactly how they say it, but uh, there's a legal implication to those words. So when you, when you decide to use some other terminology, uh, you just made it difficult for me or another auditor to come in and to assess quickly that you're being compliant. Um, I know software is a good example. Uh, software uses a lot of terminology that you will not find in the standard of the regulation. Uh, so if nothing else, you need to be sure you've, kind of like when you're using references in your quality manual where you say, okay, this is my, document number and this aligns with uh, 
4.2.1 of the standard, you're providing a reference so that I know that, okay, this is where I go to find that element. Uh, so you need to at least do something like that. But uh, engineering uh, needs to gravitate a bit more to the, uh, what's, in the what's in the regulation of the standard because that's ultimately, no matter what you want to do, uh, that's law in most cases, whether it be uh, in the U.S. or in the EU, and the law gets top billing uh, no matter what you want to do. Uh, okay, we're going to switch gears again. Kind of a long question. Conceptually, this is all simple. Write down what you're going to do, then do it. But everyone's quote unquote regular job always seems to take priority so that quality and auditing is a distraction. What advice do you have to make audit preparation part of our company culture? Uh, that I would tell you it's, um, it's little bites, okay? You're not gonna turn the ship uh, quickly. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that management is uh, aligned with what you're trying to do. Uh, it's in management's best interest to make sure that you're complying with the, the law uh, or the standards because uh, they're spending a lot of money to make sure that you're building a product that you can sell. And the last thing you want is to be uh, confounded by uh, not following the procedures. So, uh, yes, it's you've got a day job and you're saying, well, I don't have time to really prepare. Uh, you need to start out with little steps. You know. The very first thing would be, okay, let's be sure that we uh, start out with your, your audit checklist. And what you can use that checklist for is, is to help you communicate to management uh, and show them that here's some areas that are not compliant and we need to get those back on track. The more you communicate with executive management, the more engaged they are. And uh, what I have found is uh, I've had I went into a company that had uh, a number, well, they had uh, 28 uh, non-conformances, major non-conformances. And a major is, is bad because once you get a major, you've got uh, between 60 and 90 days to clear that major and keep your certificate uh, in good shape. Uh, before that audit, uh, the executive management uh, kind of blew off uh, the quality system. After that audit, uh, they got religion real quick and all, all of a sudden became uh, the cheerleaders for the quality management system. So you need to get senior management engaged. And the way I would do that is start out with the uh, list of quality commitments you have in your company. Stephen, your, your answer, you mentioned major nonconformances. So a two-part question regarding major nonconformances. First of all, during the audit, Will the auditor share enough such that you know there's going to be a major nonconformance? And if so, how much should you push back on the auditor? Don't push. Uh, that that is, you might win a battle there, but you'll lose the war. And it doesn't matter whether it's FDA or it's ISO. Uh, all you got to do is get it into a confrontational situation. The auditor is going to win every time. Uh, and it's not that they want to win, but uh, what they see, if you're being, uh, if you're pushing back, um, they, they have already got the, the feeling based on the nonconformance that you're not in compliance. And then when you uh, become, quote, defensive, uh, that even uh, solidifies that uh, harder. So uh, where you might have had a chance to maybe talk it down to a minor, uh, just just take it and go because uh, there's something wrong. Uh, you need to you need to get it fixed. Um, and it's not the end of the world to get a major. Uh, and sometimes it's the best thing that ever happened to you because it gets everyone uh, fully engaged in the quality management system. Next question, uh, Bob from Boston asks, is there a way to quantify the hard savings in either time or money as a result of building in a focus and early start on quality? Well, that's a, that's a good question. 
and people have been working. I mean, there's there's lots of different ways that that has been answered over the years. I, I know uh, back in the the early '80s, uh, I was working at a company, and this was about the time that the uh, the Toyota system and uh, you know total quality uh, were the new buzzwords, and uh, everyone was focused on that. And we we had all kinds of of uh, formulations and and accounting. Uh, situations to try to, to prove that it, it helped. Uh, a simple thing that I went through was uh, there was a little uh, exercise that uh, uh, an author that I, I had gone to a seminar for uh, had us go through. And what it demonstrated to me visually was that uh, by having a consistent process, we could reduce um, our quality problems by a minimum of 30%. I went back home and in my own operation did what he suggested and, and he was uh, spot on. Uh, we dropped uh, our uh, cost of quality by, by 30%. So uh, having a non-compliant system is a lot more expensive than having a compliant system. Uh, just the time you're gonna spend in non-conformances, uh, you could do a whole lot of other things uh, with that time and that money. I really like this next question. What are some of the factors I should consider when selecting an ISO certification company? So we're talking about, uh, I guess I need some clarification there. Uh, if we're talking about a registrar or notified body, uh, that's one situation. Uh, if you're talking about somebody to help you uh, get ISO certified, that'd be another. Let's, let's go with though the registrar notified body. Um, it's like, you know, if you were going to go, uh, well, let's say if you're going to have surgery, uh, when you go out to pick a surgeon, uh, remember the last guy in the class got an MD and the guy that came in number one got an MD. So they both got MDs behind their name. I want to go with the guy that's done 6,000 procedures that I'm having done versus the guy that's done 10. Uh, I want somebody that's got a lot of practice. And so uh, there are notified bodies out there right now uh, that do the preponderance of their business are medical devices. I'm more, more prone to go with that notified body uh, maybe than I am one that, that is uh, smaller, but maybe their, their main focus is in uh, uh, one of the other, uh, you know, ISO areas, you know, maybe they, they're uh, big on uh, uh, either the uh, 14,000 uh, standard or, or possibly uh, 17025 or one of the other standards uh, or even 9001. Uh, those really don't play for you if you're a quality, I mean, if you're a medical device manufacturer, uh, you want to go with someone that has the experience. I wouldn't spend as much time looking at cost uh, because ultimately at the end of the day, it's all going to kind of ring out. Uh, you want somebody that's going to be a partner with you for a long time. Steve, is, is a focus on companies with, uh, you know, ISO certification companies with medical device experience, is that granular enough or would it be beneficial to look at you know, class one, class two, class three, implantables versus wearables, software as a medical device, companies with that very specific expertise. Well, without sounding like I'm winning an ad for anybody, uh, you know, BSI is, is probably one of the largest as far as medical device uh, companies that they certify. Um, DECRA has a, a, a background in the more uh, complex class three devices. Uh, BSI does as well, but uh, those two uh, specifically are, have uh, some pretty deep focuses on uh, uh, medical devices at, at all the different levels. Uh, DECRA tends to be more, moves more toward the class two and class three. Let's talk about FDA for a minute. Uh, the question reads, the FDA requires investigation for complaints 820.198C and certain nonconformances 820.90A. What are the requirements of these investigations? 
Well, you'll notice, in, and I don't have it open in front of me, but uh, if I remember correctly, you know, they don't tell you. And so uh, they give you all the rope that, that you need to hang yourself if you're not careful. Um, what I recommend is use common sense. Uh, if, if you go back to what I was talking about, I didn't spend much time on it, but uh, we at some point really should. Uh, root cause investigation is very, very important. And that's really what uh, FDA is looking for. They want you to identify the root cause of whatever the complaint uh, uh, was about. And some things don't need, I mean, they don't require as deep of an investigation but you really need a methodology in place that you're going to use to do the investigation. Um, a complaint investigation covers many, many aspects. Uh, you need to look at the specific complaint. You need to see if a patient was involved because you may have a regulatory requirement as far as uh, a medical device report. Uh, you need to see if you have other product that might be affected. So there's a, a, a lot of different things before you actually get to, you know, what, what broke or what didn't work. Uh, and, and then that's another level of, of the investigation you need to go to uh, to determine if you need to create a corrective action for it. Steve, getting back to uh, notified bodies, should the notified body be listed on the ASL? Absolutely. They are, they are one of your suppliers. Makes sense. Um, how many mock audits would you recommend? Per year, I wouldn't recommend any mock audits. I recommend audits. There's no, in my world, there's no such thing as a mock audit. Either you, you you're going to audit or you're not. You, if you're going to go to that much trouble, take advantage of it. Have an audit. In fact, I recommend uh, companies looking at doing audits four times a year. Of course, I, and of course, I would do that because that's the business I'm in. So I want you to do as many audits as possible. But uh, the reason I use four is uh, you can get overwhelmed with audits. And by breaking it up, uh, if you have nonconformances, it gives you 90 days to, to a, affect a, a corrective action and, and possibly see even uh, uh, an effectiveness check in that time period. But if you get if you do them on an annual basis, now you've got a you know fistful of nonconformances possibly, and what happens with that is they get left in the dust behind you. You don't remember them until just before you're supposed to be audited, and then you're frantic, scrambling, trying to get uh, those resolved. And the auditor sees that right away because he can see the dates for no, for one, but he can also see that there's probably not any effectiveness checks. Uh, that you're able to do. And I think this, unless more come in, I think this may be our last question. How do you get people to really participate in the quality management system? Pain. You make them feel some pain. Uh, and I don't mean that in a necessarily a bad way, but that's where the audit's really powerful. Um, if you've got people that are not uh, being compliant, go audit their area and make them tell you how they're doing things or not doing things. And you don't have to accuse them of anything. You don't have to do anything except write down what they are doing and what they're not doing. And then put the responsibility on them to create the corrective action. And you'll find pretty quick that if all of a sudden it's on them, uh, they don't want to do that again. You know, it's kind of like when, the you know, uh, these uh, invisible fences, when the dog gets close to that, where that fence is, uh, and he's got that collar on and it makes that little uh, sound, he knows, no, I don't want to go past that again. I want, I want to make sure that I stay clear of it. So the same thing will be true with people out in your, your uh, quality management system. If they know they're being held responsible, uh, for that particular area and that there'll be, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's consequences. If they don't do it, uh, you'll find that over time you, your system becomes more and more compliant. 
and and I think there's a flip side to the coin. Um, you know, there, there are there are a lot of folks that embrace structure, that embrace process. I know that several professional lives ago, I was a little bit over my head, but I was uh, assigned as the lead for a small 125 person company to design and implement a quality management system compliant with 21 CFR Part 820. And after about six months, we had rolled out and trained on a, a core set of procedures. Uh, it was it was a, a, a surprise, a, a positive surprise that so many of our employees embraced it. They loved seeing the replacement of folklore and tribal knowledge with structure and documentation. And I think it, it brought our game up. Now, there were some employees that groused and saw it as a as something that just wasted their time. But overall, it was um, it was viewed very positively, putting a quality management system in place. But yeah, that cracking that whip and that pain element um, is, is is also uh, important to consider. Well, I don't and I don't mean that in a negative way, but at the same time, uh, you have to get people's attention, and uh, particularly in a situation where people are not used to that, uh, they need you know you need to make them responsible. If you're responsible for something then you're held accountable for it. And so that accountability is really the piece that I'm talking about. You can look at it as pain or you can look at it as uh, an opportunity to, you know, do what you're supposed to do. Accountability. I, I think that's the key word there. Well, that is, uh, that's the last of our questions. Steve, I want to thank you, uh, Steve Ford of OmedTech for an engaging discussion. And thanks to our audience for attending our webinar today and for your very insightful questions. Um, as a reminder, uh, Galen Data stands ready to help you with your connectivity needs. Our Galen Cloud platform provides a turnkey connectivity solution for a wide range of medical devices and data resources. It includes control, access control, onboard analytics, and it is secure and regulatory compliant. We look forward to seeing you at a future Galen Data webinar. And finally, please let us know, whether it's uh, Galen Data or Steve at OmedTech, let us know if there's anything that we can help you with before then. Well, thank you, Steve, once again. Thanks to our audience, and I will say goodbye.